Then the overseer says, oh, by the way, you know, since you're so lazy and made this thing slow down, made the project slow down, we're not gonna, we don't, we're not gonna pay you anything extra for working Sundays. Now, working Sundays was a big no-no because that was their Sabbath day. But then on top of that, they didn't want to pay them either. So at this point, one of the sand hogs didn't like the way these labor negotiations were going on, and he pulled a derringer out of his boot, shot the overseer in his head, and the other sand hogs chopped him up into pieces. And according to the story that came out the next day in the Brooklyn Evening Star, he should be right behind that stone right there. So this all has to be real because it's written in a newspaper, right? Now, keep in mind, all the odd stories you're going to hear in this tunnel are actually backed up in reality by old newspaper articles. So even though it's going to sound a little odd, the things I'm about to tell you, they're all real, believe it or not. So I'm not making stories up. Maybe they did 150 years ago, but not me. <laughs> all right, now what we're going to do is take a, continue our walk through the tunnel, and I'll tell you more history. But hold still, hold still. Before we do that, let me just mention a couple of things. Um, right here is a geographical midpoint of the tunnel. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because this is where they began building it. You see, when you build a tunnel, you never start at one end and work your way to the other end. Because that's working stupid. What you do is you subdivide the tunnel into as many sections as you possibly can and work on all the, seconds, all the sections simultaneously. So over here, what they did was they dug a shaft down from street level down to track level where we are. And the shaft was 33 feet wide, which is the outside width of the tunnel structure. Then they had one crew set about working the tunnel going east, and a second crew go about building the tunnel going west. So they had two, two crews working simultaneous, and that's how they were able to do it in seven months. Now, there was more to it to their speed than this, but, you know, you have to keep in mind that building something, that a tunnel of this size in seven months is an amazing feat of engineering, especially by today's construction standards. <laughs> you know, how long have they been puttering around on the 2nd Avenue subway since 1950? And they've gone about a half a mile so far? So, you know, just to compare. You know, today, if they tried to build a tunnel like this, it would take them 17 years just to get the environmental permits if they could. <laughs> so, the whole tunnel, cost $66,000 to build. But you have to keep in mind that the, uh, the value of money back in those days had the same relative value as it does today. And how do you figure that out? Simple. Read the old newspapers from 1844. The most expensive dinner in the fanciest restaurant in Manhattan in 1844 
cost 26 cents. Oh my so God. if you were making 83 cents a day in this tunnel project as a, as a stone mason, you were making a lot of money. So just you know, keep in mind the money had the same value. It's just that our money today has a lot more zeros and commas in it because of the inflation that's gone on since the Civil War. All right, so that's where that's why the discrepancy of the money comes in. But the relative value was the same. Now, um, getting back to the tunnel itself, as I mentioned before, it was a huge success. So why is it closed up? Well, there's two there's two answers to that question. First of all. The Long Island Railroad, when it first became operational, it was controlled and operated by Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now some of you may know the name in connection with Grand Central Terminal or the New York Central Railroad. Well, contrary to popular belief, Cornelius Vanderbilt's first railroad endeavor was this line right here, the Long Island Railroad. The way he became involved in it was he was kind of like drafted in. What happened was, as the Long Island Railroad neared completion to Greenport, the railroad sent its emissaries out to talk to the New York Providence in Boston and the Norwich and Worcester about establishing a through route up to Boston. So the, those railroads said, yeah, we'll be happy to work with you, but there's a condition to this. Right now, Cornelius Vanderbilt is bringing us passengers using his steamboats from Manhattan. And we don't want to upset this guy because he's vicious and, you know, takes no prisoners. And, uh, for us to deal with you, you have to get him involved in your railroad project, otherwise no dice. So the Long Island Railroad courted Vanderbilt for several months and got him to come on their board of directors by giving him a large block of unissued Long Island Railroad stock and, the, and also by buying three of his steamboats to make the connection with from Greenport to the railheads in Connecticut. So they also made him the operations director of the railroad since he had experience operating uh, transportation lines on a schedule. So he made the trains work, he made the line feasible, he operated the steamboats between Greenport and Connecticut. Now, after the first three or four months went by, and the Long Island Railroad made huge amounts of money by running the route between New York and Boston, Vanderbilt, being, a, being Vanderbilt, got the idea that he could use the Long Island Railroad as a weapon to destroy his competitors in the transportation business. In particular, there was a steamboat company and a railroad that he wanted to take over. But first he wanted to punish them, because originally, back in the 1830s, they dissed him. They refused to set up a connection with him from New York to Boston. So now he was going to get even. So what he did was he, got, he told the Long Island Railroad to cut their fare in half from $5 a person to, to more than that, more, from $4.50 $4 a person down to $2 a person for the run between New York to Boston. Now, uh, what happened was the other railroad, the other railroad and the other steamboat company couldn't compete. So because of the because of the price war, this value of their stock on Wall Street went down so low that Cornelius Vanderbilt and his buddy J uh, Daniel Drew were able to buy up all their stock real cheap. And this is called a hostile takeover. <laughs> Vanderbilt invented it. So uh, after he took over those lines, he was supposed to go and restore the Long Island Railroad's. Um, uh, fare back to $4.50 again, but that didn't happen. Why? Because Vanderbilt wanted to, in particular, punish the town of Providence, Rhode Island, because they wouldn't let him use their dock back in the 1830s. So he wanted to put the town out of business. So he wanted to institute a new southerly railroad connection from Boston down to, uh, down to uh, Greenport, and this was called the Fall River Route. The Fall River route would involve using a railroad that already existed between Boston and a town just south of it called Fall River. And then an 80 mile ferry trip from Fall River to Greenport. Then the Long Island Railroad from Greenport into New York. Now, what they needed to do to make this, this line functional all the way out to Fall River with that huge piece of, of, of water ride in the middle of it was make a very high speed steamboat that was extremely luxurious and could carry a huge amount of cargo and passengers. So Vanderbilt personally designed this specially uh, constructed steamboat named the Atlantic. 
and it was twice as fast and carried twice as much as all the other steamboats built previously. It was the biggest and fastest steamboat made in the United States up until that time. And the Long Island Railroad was supposed to pay for it, $150,000. Now keep in mind, $150,000 is more than double of what it cost to build this tunnel, so it was a lot of money. Now, three weeks after the order went in for this boat, the Long Island Railroad's other directors chickened out and canceled the order for the Atlantic. So Vanderbilt went ballistic and he turned on the Long Island Railroad because no one double-crosses Vanderbilt and gets away with it.